In this lecture podcast, I talk about another important aspect of administrative law, which concerns uh, freedom of information. We often think of administrative law, and we have discussed that topic so far in the context of undertaking an application for merits review by the Administrative Appeals Tribunal or some other administrative tribunal in the States, or in the context of applying for judicial review uh, by the courts. And typically, uh, those types of reviews involve applications by individuals who have been affected by uh, decisions of an executive or by an administrative, administrative agency. However, we will recall that administrative law focuses actually on a broader principle that the activities of the activities and decisions of the executive should be subject to law and that therefore there should be a mechanism whereby when the government when the executive government acts or makes decisions that are excessive or contrary to law there must be a mechanism by which individuals or the citizens or corporations can actually apply for a review of those executive decisions. So the understanding being that uh, it is to the advantage of society if there are mechanisms by which executive action and decision making should be regulated to avoid the unlawful exercise or an excessive exercise of the powers of the executive. There is, however, another component whereby the activities and decisions of the executive can actually be regulated and controlled, and that is through uh, the access by the citizens to information that is held by the government. And that is the focus of our lecture podcast today, and that is to talk about freedom of information as another crucial feature of administrative law for the purpose of controlling and regulating the actions and decisions of the executive government. And our intention is that after studying this topic, you should then be able to discuss and explain the importance of freedom of information legislation, the key, the key principles of the FOI Act, the legal right of access under the FOI Act, and the exemptions, condition exemptions, and public interest factors under the FOI Act. We will begin by uh, acknowledging that as far as freedom of information is concerned, it started with the enactment by the Commonwealth Parliament of the Freedom of Information Act in 1982. And as we will obviously notice later on, the power of the Commonwealth Parliament to enact legislation concerning freedom of information could only relate to uh, documents that pertain to the Commonwealth government because the uh, Commonwealth Parliament has no power to legislate in relation to documents, for example, held by the states or the territories. And uh, given, therefore, the impetus provided by the Commonwealth Parliament in passing the Freedom of Information Act Commonwealth, the uh, six Australian states, as well as the Australian Capital Territory and the Northern Territory, passed their own uh, legislation concerning freedom of information. So Victoria, for example, was the first to have enacted its own Freedom of Information uh, Act, which then uh, pertained to giving access to the public of government documents that belonged to the state of Victoria. And that is true as well for the Freedom of Information uh, Acts that were passed, for example, by the Australian Capital Territory in 1989, by the New South Wales in 1989, South Australia in 1991, Tasmania in 1991, Queensland in 1992, Western Australia in 1992, and then very belatedly, the Northern Territory in 2002. So therefore, we now see that there is a framework of legislation concerning freedom of information that covers uh, the entire entirety of Australia, not only at the level of the Commonwealth, but also at the level of the states and the territories. Now, 
what is the overriding purpose of the Freedom of Information? According to the Guide to the Freedom of Information Act, 1982, which was published by the Office of the Australian Commissioner, the democratic purpose of FOI legislation in Australia is to confer a legal right on members of the public to access information held by the government. So let's be clear that there is a democratic purpose to the enactment of the freedom of information legislation in, in Australia. And that is, uh, not only does it enable, for example, uh, a better public scrutiny of actions of the government, but particularly it provides a legal right on members of the public to access information held by the government. And when we speak of the government, you will later see that the information to which the members of the public can have access to does not is, is not limited to information held solely by the executive government, but also even to the judiciary in relation to uh, documents which are of an administrative nature, as we will see later on in the course of this lecture podcast. Now, what are the functions of an FOI? And this is crucial because it helps us to better understand the purpose for the enactment by the Commonwealth Parliament and the state and uh, territory parliaments of a freedom of information legislation. So first of all, an FOI provides a mechanism for individuals to see what information is held about them on government files and then to see to correct that information if they consider it wrong or misleading. So we will actually notice that in many cases, the reason why individuals would attempt to exercise their rights under the FOI is not so much to examine decisions, uh, to examine the reasons, for example, for uh, decisions made by the executive, but more particularly to be able to see what information that the government holds about them. Because under the FOI Act, uh, individuals and the public have a right to have that information corrected if the information is wrong or misleading. And this is something we will uh, discuss in detail in this lecture podcast. Secondly, an FOI also has a key function because it enhances the transparency and accountability of policy making administrative decision making and government service delivery. What this means is that because of the FOI, the government, for example, uh, is required to be able to provide to the public um, many of its policy documents without even having to be prompted by the government that they should be published. So there is a, a mechanism in the, FOI, in the FOI Act which encourages uh, government executive government agencies to publish on their own uh, the, their uh, policies and rules which have a relevance to the public. And this therefore provides greater transparency and accountability of policy making because anything that the, the executive does or even anything that um, a government minister does is now subject to public scrutiny. And because of public scrutiny, it becomes, public scrutiny becomes some kind of a dis disinfectant because it uh, makes available to the public and therefore enables the public to complain against uh, any shoddy or any irregular uh, actions or decision making made by the government. Another key function of NFOI is that a com community that is better informed can participate more effectively in the nation's democratic processes. So imagine if a lot of uh, the documents of the government, its discussions, its policy guidelines, are not available to the public. In that case, the public is quite blind as to how decisions are made by the government in relation to them and would have limited opportunity to actually bring to the public forum the uh, th these decisions and actions by the executive. Another key function of the FOI is that there is greater recognition that information that is gathered by government at public expense is a national resource and should be made available more widely to the public. So there is a presumption that it is to the interest of the public in general that information that is 
uh, with the government, especially if it has been uh, gathered at public expense, is actually a national resource, which should be made available more widely to the public. So in case of doubt, the doubt should be resolved in favor of having the public provided access to government information. And we can see, for example, uh, in the context of the Right to Information Act 2009 of, of the state of Queensland, the function of an FOI. So under the Free Right to Information Act 2009 passed by the state of Queensland, uh, the function of an FOI is that there is a recognition that the Queensland Parliament recognizes that in a free democratic society, there should be open discussion of public affairs. And information in the government's possession or under the government's control is a public resource. And the community should be kept informed of government's operations, including in particular, the rules and practice followed by government in its dealings with members of the community. And openness in government enhances the accountability of government. And openness in government increases the participation of members of the community in democratic processes leading to a better informed decision making. And the right to information legislation contributes to healthier representative democratic government and enhances its practice. And right to information legislation improves public administration and the quality of government decision making. So we will see, therefore, that the enumeration of the objects or the purposes of an FOI uh, gives us a sense of why an FOI is crucial to a free and democratic society. And it is these principles and purposes which typically guide administrative agencies when there has been a request from a member of the public for information to uh, government, uh, government information uh, when, the, when, when, the member, when a member of the public would ask for it. Now, under the, going back now to the Freedom of Information Act of 1982 Commonwealth, the object of the FOI, as stated in Section 3.1 of that legislation, is to extend as far as possible the right of the Australian community to access to information in the possession of the government of the Commonwealth. So we will notice that the FOI Act Commonwealth uh, focuses on access to information in the possession of the government of the Commonwealth. And so in other words, the FOI Act Commonwealth does not legislate in relation to information in the possession of the government of the states or of the territories, simply because the Commonwealth Parliament does not have the constitutional power to legislate in relation to documents or information held by the governments of the states or of the territories. So under the FOI Act Commonwealth, the object of the FOI is to extend as far as possible the right of the Australian community to access to information in the possession of the government of the Commonwealth by one, making available to the public information about the operations of departments and public authorities, and in particular, ensuring that rules and practices affecting members of the public in their dealings with departments and public authorities are readily available to persons affected by those rules and practices, and B, creating a general right of access to information in documentary form in the possession of ministers, departments, and public authorities, limited only by exemptions and exemptions necessary for the protection of essential public interests and the private and business affairs of persons in respect of whom information is collected and held by departments and public authorities. So we will observe that under the FOI Act of the Commonwealth, there is a general right of access to information in documentary form that is in possession, not only of executive agencies, but also in the possession of ministers and their departments. The FOI Act, however, we will also see here, and this is something that we go in de detail in the lecture podcast, is that there are exemptions and there are exemptions uh, to the right of public access to uh, information held by the Commonwealth government. And such limitations typically involve the protection of essential public interests and the private and business affairs of persons. And finally, the, the other object of the FOI Act, as uh, stated in Section 3.1, is 
about creating a right to bring about the amendment of records containing personal information that is incomplete, incorrect, out of date, or misleading. And in fact, most, as I mentioned, most of the attempts to exercise uh, the right uh, by members of the public under the FOI Act pertains to uh, an attempt to access personal information that is held by the government for the purpose of trying to secure an amendment of such records where those records are incomplete, incorrect, out of date, or misleading. So what is the interpretive rule under the FOI Act? So in other words, if there is a, in, case of a, in case of doubt, because on the one hand, we know that the FOI, FOI Act recognizes a general right of the public to access information held by the common government. And on the other hand, we know that the FOI Act as well recognizes that there are certain inherent limitations on the power of the public to access uh, government information. So therefore, the FOI Act provides exemptions and exemptions to the right of the public to uh, access certain government information. But there is an interpretive rule under the FOI Act as provided under Section 3.2 of that Act. It provides that it is the intention of the Parliament that the provisions of this Act shall be interpreted so as to further the object set out in subsection 1 and that any discretions conferred by this Act shall be exercised as far as possible so as to facilitate and promote promptly and, the low, and at the lowest reasonable cost the disclosure of information. So as an interpretive rule and in case of doubt, the FOI Act leans towards the disclosure of information. It leans towards the, uh, a, an obligation on the part of government agencies to, prom to facilitate and promote promptly and the, under the lowest reasonable cost, the disclosure of information. So that is a guiding principle that we should always remember in trying to understand the Freedom of Information Act and that the power and the rights that that act has recognized to now inhere in members of the public. And in terms of the key principles as embodied in the FOI Act, these are some of the key principles. One, all members of the public enjoy an equal right of access to government documents. So it does not make a distinction as to who the member of the public is. So it could, in, it could be an individual that has been impacted by a decision, government decision, or it could be any member of the public who is simply interested in knowing what is going on with the government. It could also be journalists who would seek to have access to government documents. So in other words, as far as a key principle is concerned, it is all members of the public who enjoy an equal right of access to government documents. And which means, therefore, that an FOI applicant is not even required to explain their reason for seeking access, or nor is there a need for them, for an applicant, to demonstrate a special need for or interest in a document. It is a right. And because it is a right, it means, therefore, that there is no need for an individual to provide an explanation or to make a justification for seeking access to a government document. So, therefore, a government minister, for example, or government agency cannot deny access to a public document simply because an individual really has no personal interest in uh, certain information that is held by the government. That is not a, an excuse or a reason for the, for the government to deny access to uh, public information. Because, as I said, it is a key principle of the FOI that it is all members of the public who enjoy an equal right of access to government documents. The FOI Act also, as a key principle, provides that the right of access to government documents is a legal right. And because it is a legal right, a government agency or minister has no residual discretion to deny access to documents upon request. And so therefore they can only uh, do so, meaning deny access to uh, documents if such a document is exempt from disclosure under the FOI Act. The FOI Act also uh, provides a mechanism for appeal against decisions of an agency or a minister. So in the event that a person has been denied access to a document, that person can appeal against the decision of the agency or minister. He can do that to an independent tribunal. So, such as the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. And we will be talking about the five mechanisms by which 
uh, decisions of the, uh, under the FOI Act uh, have been made and the mechanisms for appeal, including bringing it to the attention of the Australian Information Commissioner, commissioner or uh, seeking an inter internal review of the decision which denies uh, a request for uh, government uh, access to government information. Uh, that's something we take up in a short while. So when a person has been denied access to a document, there is an appeal that is available against the decision of the agency or minister to an independent tribunal, which can then review the merits of that decision and make a fresh determination that is binding on the agency or ministers. In particular, the AAT has the power of review uh, of uh, a government decision that denies a request for access to government information. Uh, at the same time, at all stages of the FOI processing, processing and review process, the agency or minister bears the onus or the burden of establishing that their decision denying access to public information is justified. There is also a, a, a principle under the FOI that agencies must publish information that explains their role and work, such as their decision-making powers, organizational structure, categories of documents, FOI procedures and policies and guidelines applied in making decisions that affect members of the public. An agency or minister may also grant access to any document, even if that document actually is an exempt document, unless that agency or minister is prevented by a secrecy provision in another statute from doing so. In other words, even if a document is considered an, a, a, an exempt document, which we define shortly in this lecture podcast, it doesn't bar or prevent an, an agency or minister from actually providing access to such a document, unless there is a, another statute, a statute containing a secret, secrecy provision which inhibits or prevents such an agency or minister from actually uh, providing public access to such a document. So going back to the right of access under section 11 of the FOI Act, that uh, provision provides a legally enforceable right to every person to documents in the possession of agencies and ministers. So it, provides, it states that subject to this act, every person has a legally enforceable right to obtain access in accordance with this act to a document of an agency other than an exempt document or an official document of a minister other than an exempt document. So subject to this act, a person's right of access is not affected by any reasons the person gives for seeking access or the agency's or minister's belief as to what his or her reasons are for seeking access. Now, let's just kind of uh, delve deeper into the importance of the right of access. So not only did we say that it provides the freedom of information, provides uh, an opportunity for the public to know what is going on with the government, and it provides, therefore, public transparency and openness to government documents, which therefore enhances democratic processes and they enhances uh, public scrutiny and accountability. There is, however, another important reason for the freedom of access uh, to information, and that is because of the fact that we will recall that there is actually no common law right uh, on the part of, the, of an individual to be given a reason uh, why an executive uh, decision maker makes a decision in relation to the person. So in other words, under common law, when a government agency or an executive agency makes a decision that affects an individual, such a government agency or executive does not have a legal right, uh, does not have a legal duty or obligation to provide a reason for his or her decision. There is no duty. The only time when a government minister or agency is required to provide a reason for his, his or her decision that affects a member of the public is when there is a statute that provides for such an obligation. However, if a statute is silent about whether reasons should be given, or when an executive, for example, uh, exercises his powers, which are known as prerogative powers, there is no requirement for that exe government executive or agency to provide a reason for the decision. And therefore, we will see the value of the FOI because under the FOI Act, it would then be possible 
for an individual who has been adversely affected by a decision of a government executive, minister, or agency to then obtain documentation relating to the decision. And in doing so, it would then be possible for such an individual to better understand how and why a decision, for example, was reached and to determine and ascertain the possible grounds on which to challenge it. Now, let me clarify that when I said that there is no common law duty uh, for an executive agency or uh, an executive or government minister to provide reasons for his or her decision that affects the rights or interests of an individual, I was speaking clearly in terms of an executive agency or a government minister. However, if in, in, in the context of an administrative tribunal or an agency that may be exercising uh, quasi-judicial powers in the sense that uh, its actions uh, clearly involve the exercise of powers that, that impact on the rights of individuals, that uh, in, in that case, there may be an implied duty for, for that agency to act fairly or impartially. And in that case, it may seek to act judicially. So only in the context, for example, of um, government agencies that are exercising quasi-judicial powers, so we're speaking, therefore, of administrative tribunals, those administrative tribunals would be required to provide reasons for their decisions because they're acting in a quasi-judicial capacity. So although these tribunals belong to the executive and do not belong to the judiciary because they have not been created as Chapter 3 courts under the Australian Commonwealth Constitution, because they're acting as administrative tribunals with the power to determine uh, or make determinations on the rights and interests of certain individuals, then they will be required to act judicially. Meaning, uh, not only do they are they required to uh, ensure that the right to natural justice is observed, so the right, for example, to to provide individuals with uh, with the right to hearing or the right uh, to to ensure that individuals uh, are, are uh, given reasons for the decision, but uh, that obligation to provide reasons for, the, for a decision will not apply in relation to uh, member uh, to to the to executive departments or to executive ministers and to executive agencies. So the right to uh, reasons for decision would only happen or only exist in the context of decisions made by administrative tribunals, or what are known as quasi-judicial uh, bodies, which therefore belong to the executive. Now, as I pointed out, there are actually limitations on the right of access, and one of the first limitations is because it, it is a, uh, it, the, the document involved may, may be an exempt document uh, under Section 11 of the FOA Act, and there is also a, right, a limited right of access or, limitation, or a limitation of the right of access in relation to the documents held by exempt persons and bodies under Section 7, Section 7 of the FOA Act Common Law. And this is now something that we examine. So let's begin by looking at the exempt agencies. So naturally, there are certain uh, agencies which the Common Law Parliament recognizes should be exempt from disclosure of public information. And... Uh, so under the FOI Act, certain government agencies are deemed not to be prescribed authorities for the purposes of, and therefore are exempt from, the operation of the FOI Act. And these are the Aboriginal Land Councils and Land Trusts, the Auditor General, the Australian Government Solicitor, the Australian Secret Intelligence Service, the Australian Security Intelligence Organization, the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security, the National Workplace Relations Consulta Consultative Council, Office of National Assessments, Parliamentary Budget Office, and the Parliamentary Budget Officer. So the documents of these agencies uh, are not available uh, to public access under the provisions of the FOI, FOI Act, specifically Section 71. And so these government agencies, therefore, when they provide documents to other government agencies, those uh, documents 
even if they would now be in the possession of those other government agencies, would still be exempt from public access. Now, how about courts and tribunals? Are they also exempt from, uh, from uh, the provisions of the FOI Act? Under the FOI Act, uh, under Section 5, the Act also applies to courts. So even in relation to Chapter 3 courts, the FOI Act, meaning the right to access to public information, is available to the public, in re however, only in respect of administrative matters. And we will see what administrative matters means when we examine the decision of the High Court uh, in relation to the case filed by client. The FOI Act also applies to certain tribunals in respect of administrative matters under Section 6. And so therefore, it applies to decisions of the Australian Industrial Relations Commission, the Australian Fair Pay Commission, and the Industrial Registrar and Deputy Industrial Registrars. And we have to note that the holder of a judicial office or other office pertaining to a court in his or her capacity as the holder of that office being an office established by the legislation establishing the court shall be deemed not to be a prescribed authority and shall not be included in a department. So therefore, um, that a, a judge, for example, uh, is not considered to be one who is subject to the provisions of the FOI Act. So therefore, a judge cannot be compelled to, uh, to provide a certain documents or even to provide uh, reasons for his decision. Although we know already that um, in general, um, chapter three courts would be providing reasons for their decisions, but obviously there isn't something that is covered under the um, administrative law. But as a broad principle, the FOI Act does not cover uh, the holder of a judicial office himself or herself. So therefore such a holder of a judicial office cannot be compelled to, under the FOA Act, to provide access to government documents that may be in his or her possession. And the same is true as well for the holder of an office pertaining to a tribunal, authority, or body specified in Section 1. Now, let's examine, because we spoke of exempt documents, it's important that we understand what is a document. And you can see this under Section 4, that it is any of or any part of any of the following things, including any paper or other material which on which there is writing. Uh, I'll not go into that because it's something you can read from the PowerPoint slide or look at the legislation itself. Document is also any copy, reproduction, or duplicate of such a thing. It could also be any part of such a copy, reproduction, or duplicate, but it does not include library material maintained for reference purposes or cabinet notebooks. Now, the reason why library material, for example, uh, is not covered under the FOI is that it's already generally, such a material is generally already available to the public anyway. So therefore, um, it becomes a, an administrative, it could become an administrative nightmare if there has to be a right to access to library material because then it would appear that there is a legal obligation on the part of government libraries to supply certain material to the public. And therefore, that will add to the costs of, uh, of uh, the machineries, and the operations of the government. So therefore, uh, library material that is already maintained for reference purposes is not covered as a document under the Freedom of Information legislation. The same is true also for cabinet notebooks. But the reason for that in this sense would be because although uh, the Freedom of Information Act seeks to increase public scrutiny of the uh, decisions and actions of the government, there are still certain areas where uh, the Commonwealth Parliament recognizes that uh, government ministers and the cabinet should be free from uh, the public glare. Because otherwise, if cabinet notebooks, for example, were to be, uh, to be made available to the public, there is a big likelihood that um, there will be less uh, openness and freedom on the part of cabinet ministers to be making discussions because they know that anything that they say or do can then be subject to public scrutiny and may therefore uh, uh, be the subject of uh, public discussion that could be misinformed or that could be outright uh, the basis, be the basis of simply an attempt to uh, 
uh, poke at defective uh, government decisions solely from the viewpoint of um, a, a public, a, a political bias or a political agenda. So therefore, under the Freedom of Information Act, cabinet, cabinet notebooks uh, are, are not covered uh, by what is considered to be a document that is available to the public as a matter of right. Now, what is an exempt document? So an exempt document is a document which, by virtue of a provision of Part 4, is an exempt document. It is also a document in respect of which, by virtue of Section 7, an agency, person, or body is exempt from the operation of, of this act, or it could be an official document of a minister that contains some matter that does not relate to the affairs of an agency or of a department or of a state. So, uh, and we're going to be looking at this in detail, but j just observe, for example, that there is a distinction between an official document and a personal document. So, um, so what is an exempt document? So, an, a document that would be. Uh, so, what is an exempt document under Section Four? An official document of a minister that contains some matter that does not relate to the affairs of an agency or of a department or of a state. That would be considered an exempt document. So, and what is an, a document of an agency? So, a document of an agency. Uh, means a document in the possession of an agency or in the possession of the agency concerned as the case requires, whether it has been created in the agency or received in the agency. So in other words, it's possible for an agency to possess documents be, uh, documents coming from other government agencies that would still be considered a document of an agency. Now, there are certain conditional exemptions under the FOI Act. And so therefore, under the FOA Act, the right of access to documents in the possession of agencies and ministers is not absolute. And so therefore, access to certain documents that are considered exempt documents uh, for the purposes of the Act may be denied by an agency or minister under Section 31B. And these exempt documents fall into three broad categories. There are exemptions to protect the workings of government, exemptions to protect third-party interests, and exemptions to uphold other recognized legal interests. And let's examine these exemptions in detail. So the first would be exemptions to protect the workings of government. And these uh, typically involve cabinet deliberations, national security, defense and internal relations, commonwealth state relations, the national economy, the internal deliberations of government in policy formulation and decision making, as well as law enforcement and the protection of public safety. So therefore, documents that protect the workings of government as uh, stated in sections 33 up to 40 of the Freedom of Information Act Commonwealth are conditionally exempt documents. So therefore, it is within the power of a government minister or the head of an agency to deny uh, public access to these, to these types of, uh, to those types of governments which protect the workings of government. As well, uh, there are exemptions uh, in relation to documents which are meant to protect third-party interests. So therefore, uh, those documents which pertain to confidential informants, personal information, material obtained in confidence and trade secrets, as well as commercial and business information, uh, are exempt, are, are conditionally exempt documents. So in other words, for example, while a person may have the power or may have the right to seek personal information about himself, that individual, because of pri the Privacy Act, uh, has no... Uh, has no right to seek personal, the personal information relating to a third person. There is a third set of uh, conditionally exempt documents, and these relate to exemptions that are meant to uphold other recognized legal interests. So, information to which a secrecy in other legislation applies, documents relating to legal professional privilege, information whose disclosure would constitute a contempt of parliament or of court, certain documents relating to companies and securities legislation and electoral rules and related documents. Again, we say that these are conditionally exempt because although a government minister or a head of an agency may refuse access to such documents, it is still within the power of that government minister or, agent or head of agency to actually provide public access to the public. So it is within the power of the government minister acting on his or her discretion to provide access to such documents. And that would be uh, consistent 
with the with the objective or the object of the Freedom of Information Act Commonwealth to provide as much access as possible to the public of documents that are in the possession, possession of the Commonwealth government. Now, it's crucial for us at this stage to examine uh, a previous decision made by the Administrative Appeals Tribunal in the case of Howard uh, and Treasurer. And that is crucial because in that specific case, the Administrative Appeals Tribunal had actually identified five factors that could support a claim that disclosure of an internal working document would be contrary to the public interest and therefore uh, enable a government minister or the head of a government agency to deny public access. So, for example, in the case of uh, Re Howard and Treasurer of Commonwealth of Australia, the former um, government, the, the former Prime Minister of Australia, John Howard, who was then the deputy leader of the federal opposition, had lodged a freedom of information request to access uh, documents uh, that the government gave to the Australian Council of Trade Unions Task Force concerning the formulation of the 19, 1984 to uh, 1985 budget. At the time, the former treasurer of uh, the Commonwealth government, Paul Keating, had issued a conclusive certificate. So a conclusive certificate is no, has, um, is no longer available uh, and that has been amended by uh, current legislation under the FOI Act. And, but on the basis of the previous, uh, the way that the FOI Act was enacted then, uh, it was permissible for the government treasurer to issue a conclusive certificate, which would then debar or prevent a member of the public to gain access to a certain public document. And in that case, the previous treasurer, Paul Keating, issued a conclusive certificate which claimed that there were, that some of the documents uh, in the category of documents requested were internal working documents and that for those documents to be disclosed uh, would be contrary to the public interest. And because of the denial uh, of, this, uh, of this request for access that had been made by John Howard, uh, John Howard sought a review of the decision to refuse access uh, to those documents, and he made he did so under Section 58.5 of the FOI Act by filing a right of, by filing a an application for review to the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, and the Administrative Appeals Tribunal upheld the decision of uh, the former Treasurer Paul Keating, which uh, had had uh, denied uh, access to government documents that have been requested by John Howard. And the denial and, the, and uh, the, the decision of the AAT to uphold the decision of Paul Keating to deny access to certain public documents was based on the fact, one, that the author of the document was of high seniority. Two, there was a risk of the document being misinterpreted or misunderstood. Three, there was a possibility that following disclosure, there could be confusion or unnecessary debate. And for these reasons, these were uh, key reasons. For these reasons, known as the Howard factors, the uh, the, the decision of uh, former uh, Commonwealth Treasurer Paul Keating to deny access to those documents was upheld by the AAT. As well, uh, one of the other factors was that which were part which were part of the Howard factors was that um, the disclosure must be to enhance policy development. So therefore, if if the disclosure was not really intended for policy development, as for example, the purpose was really to uh, enable the opposition to have ammunition by which they could attack the decisions of the sitting government, that would again be a, a, a factor that would go against public disclosure of the information. As well, one of the other factors was that if disclosing it would then inhibit frankness and candor. The understanding being that if every time a decision of a government minister is, is uh, open to public scrutiny, there was a likelihood that uh, government ministers, for example, may be inhibited from being frank and, uh, being, uh, and being honest or being transparent about, about the way they, they go about decision making. Now, this is a crucial point because after the uh, decision made by the AAT in the case of Re Howard and Treasurer of the Commonwealth of Australia, the Commonwealth Parliament subsequently uh, amended the FOI Act so that these five Howard factors uh, are no longer uh, permissible grounds 
for uh, public information to be denied access to members of the public. So the five, uh, these five factors, which are known as the Howard factors, have explicitly, under an, an amendment to the uh, Freedom of Information Act of 2010, have uh, explicitly uh, uh, been recognized as invalid grounds for denying access to the public of government documents. So that under the 2010 amendment, there are now certain factors which favor access. And for example, let's begin by looking at Section 11 of the FOA Act, which identifies the public interest factors that favor access and the irrelevant factors that must not be taken into account in deciding whether access to the document would, on balance, be contrary to the public interest. It provides, for example, the factors that would favor access uh, would, be, uh, would be any of the following. When, uh, the when granting access would promote the objects of this act, when it would inform debate on a matter of public importance, when it, it will promote effective oversight of public expenditure, and it would allow a person to access his or her personal information. So these factors actually favor uh, access to government information, and that is crucial in the way by which a government minister or the head of a government agency may seek to examine a request for access to government information, not only in terms of a general access to public documents, but even to those documents that are, condition that are considered to be exempt documents conditionally. So these are factors that would favor government access. Uh, let me jump there. Hold on. What's going on? Now, at the same time, the Freedom of Information Act was amended in 2010 so that there are now irrelevant factors. So under the amendment, the following factors must not be taken into account in designing whether access to the document would on balance be contrary to the public interest. One, access to the document could result in an embarrassment to the Commonwealth government or cause a loss of confidence in the Commonwealth government. So even if uh, giving access to the document to the public could result in embarrassment to the Commonwealth government, that is no longer a factor that is relevant to the decision whether or not to provide government public access to the document. As well, access to the document, so even if access to the document could result in any person misinterpreting or misunderstanding the document, that again is an irrelevant factor to the right of the public to access public information. So again, this is a, a um, clear disavowal or rejection of what are known as the Howard factors. As well, uh, one of the irrelevant factors would be about the author of the document which being a, of high seniority in the agency to which the request for access to the document was made. Again, a Howard factor, which now has been explicitly rejected by the um, 2010 amendment as a reason for the denial of the right of, a pub, of the public to government information. And so another irrelevant factor would be that access to the document could result in confusion or unnecessary debate. So even if providing uh, public access to the information would result in confusion or unnecessary debate, that is not a valid reason for the denial of public access to government information. So let's examine a uh, a uh, recent decision of the High Court concerning the, uh, the effect of the freedom of information. And this relates to the decision of the High Court in Klein versus Official Secretary to the Government General, which was decided by the High Court in 2013. So in this case, Ms. Klein had made a request under Section 15 of the FOI Act for access to certain categories of documents held by the Official Secretary to the Commonwealth Government General, including decisions on the award of Australian honors. Now, under Section 6A of the FOA Act, it provides that documents held by the official secretary to the Governor General were excluded from disclosure unless they related to matters of an administrative nature. So this case allows us, therefore, to get a sense of what would constitute a document of an administrative nature. Now, in that case, the High Court ruled that documents relating to nomination of person of a person to the Order of Australia were excluded from disclosure by operation of Section 6A1. So, in that case, the High Court ruled that the Freedom of Information Act does not pursue its objects as legislative purposes at any cost. 
So the statutory scheme is complex in achieving a balance between the exposure of some government processes and activities to increase public participation and scrutiny by making information freely available to persons on request, and at the same time exempting other government processes and activities from public participation and scrutiny in order to secure a competing or conflicting public interest in non-disclosure. So therefore, the High Court, as well as the FOA Act, recognizes that there is a balancing of interests that is involved. On the one hand, there is a, uh, an intention to provide bigger, wider access to the public of government documents, but at the same time, there is a, a need to limit public uh, access to certain government documents where they may impinge on the proper uh, functions and operations of executive governments and agencies. So an, a clear exemption uh, would be, uh, a clear example of the exemption would relate to the activities of, or the, or the not just the activities, but the exemption of the Australian Securities Intelligence Organization from the operation of the FOA Act. Because in that case, obviously the, the activities of the, of the ASIO are uh, need to be confidential and uh, kept in confidence so as not to uh, diminish its ability to undertake its security activities. So the ACO, therefore, is a government agency that is exempt from the provisions of the FOA Act. As well, the government general, in common with judges, takes an oath to undertake his or her functions without fear or favor. So judges and the government general in relation to his or her substantive functions are also uh, not within the ambit of the FOI Act. Because otherwise, if, you know, it, it, even if it's uh, their deliberations were to be open to public scrutiny, then there would be a danger that they would be compelled to act in a manner that uh, would likely uh, be to favor the public or likely to avoid uh, public uh, complaints or public criticism. But because the, the Governor General, as well as the courts, should be uh, have an oath to undertake their functions without fear or favor, then at the same time, they should be uh, protected from uh, public scrutiny in certain instances. And so in that, in that case, the High Court said that the analogous exclusion of federal courts and specified tribunals, authorities and bodies from the general operation of the FOI except for documents which relate to matters of an administrative nature, also involves a balance of conflicting public interests. So there is a long recognized public interest in the protection of judicial independence to enable holders of public office to exercise authority without fear or favor. Because judges work in public, they're obliged to give reasons and are subject to appellate review. However, not every action or and that every action undertaken by a judge in the discharge of the substantive powers and functions of ad adjudication is undertaken in public. So, for example, a revision of an unre unrevised transcript of proceedings heard in open court may occur in chambers, and that task is referable to the exercise of judicial rather than administrative powers and functions. Now, so finally, let's examine the uh, way by which uh, decisions denying access may be reviewed. There are at least five mechanisms for that. One is an internal review mechanism under Section 54.1 of the FOA Act, where uh, in the event that a, there is a denial of, of uh, access to documents, a, an internal review may be sought within 30 days or such other period as the agency allows after the day on which the decision is notified to the applicant. Secondly, a review may also be made to the Australian Information Commissioner, uh, which review is called an Information Commissioner Review or an IC Review. A review can also be made uh, over a decision denying access by applying to the AAT under Section 55 1 and 2 of the Freedom of Information Act, Commonwealth, and such a review must, uh, such application for review must be made within 60 days after receipt of notice of, inter of the internal review decision. A review can also be made uh, to the federal court on an appeal on a question of law from a decision of the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. And finally, there can be a review of such a uh, decision by the Commonwealth Ombudsman under Section 57. We're not, we're not going to be going into the details of this.
because we can't be using the entire lecture podcast to dig too deeply into the into the Freedom of Information Act. I will just, however, encourage you to, if you want, to uh, go deeper into the FOA Act by reading the statute itself. Now, the as I mentioned earlier, in most cases, individuals have uh, sought access to uh, under the Freedom of Information Act by actually seeking information about themselves. So in most cases, under their uh, access to government documents have been sought for the purpose of securing personal information. So under the FOA Act, request act, an individual can request access to his or her personal information and to have such an information amended if it is out of date, misleading, incorrect, or inaccurate. And what is personal, personal information? Personal information is information that identifies you or could, could identify you. And this could be uh, about your date of birth and post, meaning postal uh, address or post postcode. It could be about medical records, bank account details, photographs, videos, and inf even information about your opinions and where you work. So it is basically any information where you are reasonably identifiable. And uh, let's just clarify that it is impermissible to actually seek a uh, collateral review of a decision made by the by a tribunal, for example, or by a court, by seeking an, an amendment of such a uh, tribunal or a uh, court decision that is not covered under the FOI Act. A collateral view would not be permissible. So it is only under the FOI Act, it is permissible for an individual to request an amendment of an information. Uh, but it will not uh, allow a collateral review or a collateral amendment of a decision made by a court or a, an administrative tribunal. So, after studying this topic, you should then be able to discuss and explain the importance of freedom of information legislation, key principles of the FOA Act, legal right of access under the FOA Act, and exemptions, conditional exemptions, and public interest factors under the FOI Act.